And there's a good reason that we see the renewals move uh, motion moving away from sales executives. All right, the first one is it's cheaper. Um, so as we look at this, um, the percentage of, so I'm looking at this, the measurement we used on this in our benchmark was what percentage of your overall um, contract value are you paying as incentive when a certain role does the renewal? So when a renewal specialist is responsible, um, that percentage of the contract value paid out as incentive goes less than half from when it sales. And when a CSM does it, it's like halved again. So we know that when a salesperson is responsible for renewal, it's going to be a lot more expensive to execute on that renewal from almost every measurement we have. Now, to that end, we'll also tell you that we don't see a particular difference in, in at least contract renewal rates when uh, the salesperson or the specialist or the CSM is executing the renewal. Um, you know, that ends up being right at about 83 to 85%. So there's not a lot of material difference at that end. But like I said, when we talk about what we don't know, this is where we're going to be digging deeper. Uh, because just saying it's a specialist, just saying it's a CSM, just saying it's sales, there's a lot of nuance in there. Um, but where there isn't nuance, I will tell you, is around um, growth rates. There's no, there's no nuance here. Um, and we've, we've looked at this a bunch of different ways, validated it. We know that when the salesperson has primary responsibility for renewal and when they get full quota compensation credit for executing the renewal, it actually has a pretty material adverse impact on growth rates. You know, the, the point of this is when you think about hunting versus farming, you got to keep your hunters hunting. And if your salespeople can make their numbers simply by doing renewals, uh, we've seen it time and time again that there is a, a really tough impact on growth rates here. It has, it has a, a detriment. So we know that it's cheaper when somebody else besides sales does it. We know that it doesn't really impact growth rates at all. And in fact, uh, and, or excuse me, renewal rates at all. And we know that it really has you know, some, some downside from growth. Um, but there's other things that we talk about too. So for instance, um, we know that subscription growth rates increase uh, when you know, their partners actually have customer success motions as part of their remit. So you know, it's kind of this age old debate that Jared and I are helping our members with all the time. It's like, hey, you know, do our partners, um, you know, do, we, do we let them do the customer success? Do we let them do some of the adoption and the expansion motions? But it's pretty clear, Jared, like when your partners do this, um, you're going to grow at a lot, you know, at, at a lot higher rate than when partners aren't involved and nobody, you know, a lot of these motions slip through the cracks, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, partners are a scaling mechanism. We, we have a, a framework called the growth multiplier framework that, uh, that outlines various components of how uh, companies can use partners as a growth multiplier. So absolutely. Yeah. So um, look, we know that that when vendors do this with their partners, they grow more. So that th these are the things that that we we know already. Uh, like I said, we know that when sales does it, it hurts growth rates. We know that renewal rates uh, are really unchanged, and we know that uh, you know there's a real cost effective or a real cost metric on this. So we've studied this for a long time, and, and we we've seen this as the case, but. There's a lot of things that we need to find out. Uh, so before I do that, let me let me pause for a second before I kind of get into the journey and what we're really going to be finding out. Uh, Vanessa, any other questions that have come in that we can that we can take on as we transition here? So many questions. Oh yeah, I'm looking at it. we've got like 16 or 17, at least of them in the queue right now. That's uh, that's awesome. I'm glad to see people. Yeah, a lot of them. I will tell you, a lot of them are asking for the definition between the different types of roles. I don't know if that's something you're going to cover later or if you wanted to just take that on now. Uh, well, it, it never wastes a good segue. You know, you make a great point because how people categorize these roles and how people categorize what they do is going to be a really, really big part of this journey. Uh, because there's what we're realizing what Jack and Jared and I have all come to the realization on is that there's a lot of nuance here. Uh, so for instance, uh, this is a, this is from a, a poll that Jack just did at the end of last year, but it jives pretty closely with some of the research that our customer success uh, team led by 
Stephen Fulkerson and Mark Troyan have, have put together, you know, who owns the renewal from an organizational standpoint? Is it the renewal? Is it customer success? But even within that, the role looks different. So when we say customer success, the organization owns the renewal, okay, is that the CSM that's executing it? Or is it a renewal specialist that now just reports into CSMs? So how you look at this organizationally uh, have really, you know, it, it's different than what the actual person taking it on can be. Um, so we see renewal specialists, we sometimes see the account managers are making a comeback now where it's okay. The CSM has responsibility for uh, adoption motions only, but we really don't want them taking on the commercials. So we're starting to see a lot of nuance in this. So what you call the role, um, you know, whether it's a renewal specialist, whether it's a, you know, th this is this, this is a tough piece in so much of what we're going on our journey. You know, like I said, we're starting to see renewal specialists take on. We're starting to see dedicated expansion and renewal within our partners. So big piece of that. I mean, know it's a big question. Um, like I said, I think we've got more answers on this than most people, but we really want to provide as many as we can because who owns this renewal and what that, you know, nuance is amongst that, just not just a position or what you call them, organizationally, functionally, big piece of information that, that people are, are really want to understand. So hopefully that answers at least some of that question, but that's part of the reason we're also going on this journey. Um, the other thing that we're going to look at is deeper dive into the relationship between expansion and renewal. Uh, Jack and I have some preliminary data to suggest that, you know, when someone owns a renewal number but does not have a target on expansion or NRR net renewal rate growth, um, that growth rate can suffer. And in fact, that's the number one objection we hear when people say, hey, we want our salespeople to do the renewal. It's that if we don't leave it to the salesperson, when it comes to expansion, they tend to or they, you know, they don't have an expansion goal, they'll often take the path of least resistance. Right, so we're just gonna do the renewal, but we're not gonna try to push for growth. And like I said, I, I, this is a stat I talked about earlier. We know very concretely that expansion and renewal are very tightly tied together. So as part of this journey that we want you to come along with us on, um, we're gonna find out what's this relationship? What sort of growth targets do we need? To, if we're not gonna have uh, sales handle this, um, what sort of, uh, what sort of motions need to be in place from a comp perspective, from a best practices perspective, to make sure that whoever is handling the renewal also has the right incentives and the right motivation and the right capacity to grow the customers too. Jack, anything to add to that? Because this is right in your bailiwick. There are so many angles to this conversation, Steve. Um, the, um, it is absolutely true that if we can motivate um, cadences to get off cycle expansions, the, the tide rises for all revenue that follows that and renewals without doing absolutely anything more than what you're doing from an expansion perspective should, should grow um, as well. And, and then what we're finding is, is that it's really important to have CS and or renewal specialists enabled to look for value gaps and to listen for opportunities to help the customer achieve what their desired outcomes are, you know, by, by providing them access to additional, so, you know, products and services, you know, along yeah. the way. Yeah. Spot on Jack. And I'm getting, I'm, I'm actually, while Jack was talking, I was taking a little bit of a time uh, to go through uh, some of the questions that came in and I'm going to, I'm going to skip one or two things just to talk about it for a second, because um, we're going to dig into compensation as part of this, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A about how do I compensate the renewals rep? How do I compensate uh, the account executive for renewals? How do I compensate a specialist? You know, does everybody get comp? And so we're going to dig into that as part of this. And, and we actually have all sorts of data uh, in Jack's in customer growth and renewal and, and the CRO council, depending on where you fit uh, around that sort of compensation data. But I want to give you this caveat because this is really important. When Jack and Jared and I have worked with companies that are making this transformation, especially from a traditional transactional product and license maintenance model to an as-a-service one, um, we always tell people comp is important, but it comes last, not first. You can't transform your go-to model simply by aligning the comp plan. Um, there are some things you have to do first. First, you know, starting with 
getting everyone in alignment with what you're measured on with KPIs. Do we have the right people doing the right things? Um, Jack and I spend a ton of time on these critical practices, right? So regardless of who's doing it, there are things that must be done to make adoption, expansion, and renewal possible. I, did you document what the outcome was at the beginning that the customer is trying to achieve? Do you have an account plan? And what does that account plan look like? What are you doing in your QBRs? Uh, what are some of the things that you're doing from a data and analytics standpoint? These are all really critical practices because people skip to compensation. They want to know, well, what, what sales training should my CSMs have? They're going to take on renewals. Well, okay, we do have that data and we know what skills they have to have, but first you got to figure out, you know, what are they doing? Um, because if, you know, do they have the capability to handle your renewals? Uh, or are your renewals too complex for them to take on? which is why we've really started to, to come up with a model that we're going to refine. Uh, because in, you know, the old models, you know, the one throat to choke, or as one of our members just said, which I love it, you know, one neck to hug, uh, depending on if it's positive or negative. But this idea of the cowboy salesperson, and I was one, by the way, walking around with a BlackBerry on their belt buckle, which also I had, by the way, which dates myself horribly, but there you have it. Um, it it's just not a model that works anymore. Uh, especially not maybe, you know, kind of having that account executive one throat to choke at the very top of your pyramid uh, with your most strategic accounts. But below that, man, this, 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 you know, falls apart quickly. So Jack and I, along with Thomas Law, our executive director, have put together, you know, several frameworks on this as to what should sales do? What should specialists do? What should customer success do? And we can tell you, what we know already is that what you have people do really depends on two factors. One, the complexity of the task at hand. So if you look kind of on the vertical axis or axis there, you'll see how complex is the offer? <clears throat> um, is it a single uh, product offer? Is it multiple products? Um, is it the same decision maker or do they have to try to you know, loop more people in and do some complex sales things? RFPs involved. Uh, did the budget, did the decision makers turn over? Was there an acquisition uh, or, or merger? Uh, again, you can see that geographies. The more complex the deal, the greater the capability they have to have. And obviously, the less complex you can make that expansion and renewal, the less uh, capability required to do it. And we say capabilities, things like forecasting, closing, uh, qualification skills, and not just skills too, but basically like, do you have the processes and systems in place to support people? Because again, the better systems and processes you have in place, the more complex tasks they should be able to take on. So as part of this research journey, we're gonna be continually refining this model that I know a lot of you who've been in the TSIA world for a while have seen different iterations of this. Um, but we're gonna dig into what are the elements of complexity that will really make the difference between whether a CSM can do it or you need a renewal specialist or yeah, that's something we really need sales to take on. And what are the capabilities that are most important as part of this? What do your non-sales people have to do? And then we're gonna get into some other kind of interesting stuff around things like discounting. Uh, Jack and Jared and I have seen kind of from a hypothetical basis that we've actually seen when salespeople do the uh, renewal, they discount more than CSM sometimes just because, hey, we're just moving this along. We're trying to get the deal done. And that has massive downstream repercussions.